Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Father's Arts Fellowship. I was in a Hebrew melody kind of mood tonight, so I pulled some things out of the archives. But you probably don't know them because unless you were in the Jesus movement of the 1970s, you wouldn't know them. <laughs> But you might know them. But Father, we thank you for this uh, evening. We ask that you bless Greg as he teaches us. And in fact, as he just brings the word, let the Holy Spirit teach us what we need to know. And we just are so receptive to hear what you would say to our hearts. Where our hearts are soft, we ask that you uh, just make us and apply them in your hand. Any hardness, just take it away. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus put the song to our hearts. Jesus put the song to our hearts. It's a song of joy no one can take away. Jesus put the song into our hearts. Amen. Yes. Come, Brother Greg. Now, 
<laughs> you mean right now? Yeah, right now. Usually sing around. Just one song. <laughs> Mike made brownies. All right. All right. Who's ready? Who's ready to learn tonight? I am. All right. We'll get into it. We're going to let our guest. Uh, we're going to let our uh, our guest reader read chapter five for us. Chapter five. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of life, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular 
so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right. Well, this passage of Scripture has been used in a wrong way for a long time. And will I be able to stop that? No. 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 But hopefully we'll learn enough today from the Word that we can apply it just to do right. Okay? So imagine, if you would, I love that word imagine. I just, I like, uh, I like, uh, the twilight zone and that kind of stuff. Imagine a world. But imagine a man who buys a brand new luxury automobile that has heated six-way powered leather seats, dual climate control, GPS, state-of-the-art stereo, every fancy schmancy button and thing on it. All right. He invites all his friends to show him this this beautiful shiny vehicle, and oh man, it does all this fancy schmancy stuff. But the man can't use any of the accessories. He pushes the car everywhere he goes in the heat and the cold because he doesn't realize that the car has an engine. To power it all. <laughs> all right? So the luxury automobile that was supposed to be a blessing ends up being a burden. Now, many believers are like this man. All right? Because they don't know or they don't realize or they haven't utilized the power of the fact that we as believers have an engine. All right? The engine in the life of the believer is the Holy Spirit. Okay? God, and we talked about this this morning, son, um, in a little different context, but the bottom line is, the bottom line is, God never intended us to live the Christian life on our own. All right? He wants us to live a spirit-filled life. Okay? And in this particular passage of Scripture, we can you can find, find and um, attach yourself and dig into many different things. But we're just going to do two things tonight. And living a spirit-filled life requires at least these two things. And the first one is, we need to recognize the substitutes. All right? Now, this is a key verse here. Some would say it is the key verse, but I would digress on that one. It says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But look, look what the rest of that verse says in 18. Now, I brought two verses up because there's a couple words I want us to look at. All right? It says, in the International Standard Version, stop getting drunk with wine, which leads to wild living. But keep on being filled with the Spirit. All right, now, the Hebrew Roots Bible says, and do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery. All right, that word, that word, it basically means the same thing, but be filled by the Spirit. All right. Kim and I had a little discussion on that word one time. But once we figured out we both were meeting the same thing, it kind of quit pretty quickly. But but why the question really is why does God contrast drunkenness with being filled with the spirit? Because drunkenness is the devil's substitute for being filled with the spirit. You see the evil one wants wants to fill us with the spirit, all right? but not the Holy Spirit. Okay, He wants to fill us with a spirit that leads to drunkenness and excess. All right? Um, 
your King James Version, I believe, says excess. Several other versions say excess. Or, or you could say wild living or debauchery or whatever. All right. The important thing is that word that's translated as excess is asteria. And it means dissipation or indulgence. All right. So why is that so important? Because see, what happens is the more that we indulge in this behavior, all right, we let our guards down. And, when, and because the alcohol messes with your head, all right? And what happens is a lot of times you fall into sin. All right, that's why you got to look at Proverbs 20, verse 1 that says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is unwise. Now, let me give you some statistics, and these are really old statistics, all right? So I just want everybody to know this. According to the National Council of Alcoholism and Drug Dependency, uh, ncadd.org, all right, and I looked that up and my, and, and my, uh, my internet said, don't get on this site because they, they tried to take stuff from me, so it's not a secure site. Anyway, according to this website, all right, the United States, and like I said, this is, this is probably 20 years old. All right, the United States has about 13.8 million, 18 million Americans age 18 and over who are alcoholics or problem drinkers. Okay, now a problem drinker, they don't necessarily go through withdrawal with abstinence, but they do have family, social, or legal problems because of their drinking. All right. Now, according to Focus Adolescent Services, uh, more than 3 million teenagers in the United States are alcoholics. And several million more have drinking problems. All right. The leading cause, the three leading causes of death for 15 to 24 year olds are automobile accidents, homicides, and suicide. All right. And alcohol is the leading factor in all three. Then on top of that, when you have the drug crisis with fentanyl and everything else, all right, I don't really need to really get in this. So if you want to start adding up numbers, and these are old, there's at least 16 million problem drinkers. And it's an old number, all right? To make this horrible problem worse, each alcoholic or problem drinker affects the lives of at least four other people. So when we do stuff, we've got to realize every decision we make affects at least four people. You say, so if I choose to wear white socks, I'm going to affect four people? Perhaps, it will, but, you know, let, let's, let's just face it, you know, it affects spouses, your kids, employers, employees, and innocent victims of accidents. All right, so, basically, you're looking at, from these old statistics, alcohol and problem, alcoholics and problem drinkers affect 67 million other people. Wow. So now... We have approximately 300 and, well, I don't know how many since, you know, since all these people are coming up from the border. Yeah. But we have at least 330 to 350 million people. So you start looking at 67 million, that's still a huge percentage. Yeah. All right, now in addition to this, the, the U.S. Department of Justice reports that 183,000 rapes Sexual and sexual assaults involve alcohol use by the offender. That's even more bad news. Uh, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration statistics, and these are old, by the way, U.S. alcohol-related accidents kill around 14,000 people a year. All right, so, you know, I think, I think I've covered this pretty good. But look at Proverbs 23. 31 through 35, where it says, Don't gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it glides down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Yes. Your eyes will see strange things. True. Your heart will utter perverse things. True. Then you will be like, like one lying down in the heart of the sea or sprawled on the top of a mast. They hit me, but I was not hurt. They beat me up, but I did not feel it. When will I wake up? Or when will I wake up? I will look for another drink. 
All right, so Solomon, you know, Solomon, he tried it all, okay? If, if you want to know, I mean, the poster boy for excess, Solomon was it, okay? The wisest, the wisest man on earth and the richest man on earth ever, okay? You know, I mean, this guy, this guy was so wise, he had 700 wives or 700 wives and 300 concubines. This guy was so smart, he ended up with a thousand mother-in-laws. <laughs> Who's the smart one now? <laughs> you know? Okay, this guy, I mean, this guy, he did it all. He tried education, that didn't work. He tried women, that caused some problems. He ended up worshiping their gods. In the end, when he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, he's sitting down there and said, listen, man, I did it all, and I lost. So, the point being, just be careful. See, to be fair, the Bible doesn't condemn drinking of wine. All right, so in other words, and I fought this for a long time, but I don't see any, you know, because... From coming from a Baptist background, boy, I mean, we're anti-alcohol. But the Bible doesn't say anything about not having a drink. All right? But there are really strong warnings about it. You know, we need to ask ourselves the question, could this become addictive or cause problems for the ones I love? Okay, so, if you're at home, you know, and you want to have a glass of wine, and your wife or husband is cool with it, you know, that's on you. But just remember, for those that have dealt with problems, you can never stop at one. So just kind of keep just kind of keep that in mind. This isn't this isn't condemnation. Okay? All I'm trying to get people to do is think before they act. That's it. Because you see, instead of being drunk with wine, we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now that phrase, be filled, is it's an imperative mood, present tense. All right, that's a big Greek term. Imperative me mood means it's a command. And present tense means continuous action. You see, this is not a one-time experience. We need to be filled with the Spirit every day. And that word fill is plureo, and it means to fill to the full. So we're to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. But what happens when we're, when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit? Look at Acts 4.31 with me. Look what happens when we're filled. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh, that's the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Basically, when you're filled with the Spirit, it causes us to boldly live for God. All right? That's it. Remember, Satan's substitute or counterfeit causes us to foolishly dishonor God. Being filled lets us live boldly. Not being filled makes us not live boldly. Okay, that's just basically... So um, that's why we need to recognize what the substitute is. Now, when you recognize it, though, there are some results. So let's review these results. Just as drunkenness is the evidence of being filled with too much wine, which we talked about, there's also the obvious evidence of our being filled with the Spirit. And Paul lists two areas where being filled with the Spirit is evident. All right? The first one is our worship life. So, if we're filled with the Spirit, according to 19, verse 19 there in, in Ephesians, we will speak to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The word translated psalms, that's psalmos, and it literally means a, a striking or twitching with fingers or musical strings. Basically, it refers to a sacred song being sung with the accompaniment of a musical instrument. Okay? Hymns, that, that comes from the Greek word hymnos, and it probably refers to like purely vocal or a cappella music or singing without music. 
One of the best illustrations of this is when Jesus and his, what Jesus and his disciples did after the Lord's Supper. Look at Matthew 26, verse 30. And uh, basically, I did it in two, ver two different versions again. After singing the Hallel, that's where we get the word Hallelujah from, but that is a special Jewish song, all right, the Hallel. They went out to the Mount of Offer. Olives. Now, the Hebrew Roots Bible says, and offering praise, they went to the Mount of Olives. So basically, they're, they're you know, if I could, most of us have heard the Hallelujah Chorus. All right, that is one of the most beautiful um, orchestral choir songs there is. All right, I mean, I mean, and it's all based on Scripture. That's the cool thing about it. So if I were to say to you, like, hallelujah, most people know what I'm talking about. Most people do. Okay? Now, here's something that's interesting. Spiritual songs refers to songs of personal testimony. The word translated songs, that's the word ode, which we get the word ode from, which means a poem written to be sung. All right? How many... There's a there's a famous song in in the in the, the early in the middle sixties called Ode to Billy Joe, okay. Um, there's lots of songs where there's Ode to So and So. Basically, it's a poem to be sung. All right. The phrase then in the last part of nineteen, making melody in your heart to the Lord, means our hearts are in harmony with our lips. Now, I like what Tommy Heigl says here. He says. I'm what's called a prison singer. A few bars and I can't find the right key. Okay? But it, listen, it does not matter how beautiful your voice is. All right? Or how well you play an instrument. If you're not singing or playing praise to God, it's bad. However, if you're, even if you sing poorly, if it comes from your heart, God filters out the squeaks, folks. We used to, when I was going to Elmo up here, we used to have, you know, they'd always do this special song right before the preacher came up. A lot of churches do that today. There's nothing wrong with it. But bless, bless their pee picking hearts, some of them just couldn't carry a tune for nothing. <laughs> now, now, some people would complain about it but I'm sitting there looking at them like these people are they are stepping out in courage, depending on the Holy Spirit to help them get through this song. And they're showing more courage by singing out a key, praising God, than you are complaining and whining, you sap suckers. Because the point is the point is, if they're doing their best to praise God, that's the point. Because what happens, though, is a lot of times, you know, they do get these really good singers and all that, and it becomes all about the singer, and God is totally forgotten. And that, that to me, is, is bad. That's just my opinion. Okay? But regardless of our lack of singing ability, look at Psalm 95, verse 1. Oh, come. Let us sing for joy to Adonai. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. All right, singing is one way that we can give thanks always for all things unto God and unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in verse twenty. All right, we're not we're not to thank God sometimes. We're to thank God all the time. Okay, now. Even when that idiot cut me off? <laughs> yes. Because you didn't have an accident. <laughs> and then you pray that they get the work safe. Because whatever what a lot of times what inevitably happens is they blow your doors off and you end up meeting them at the stoplight. <laughs> right? So the point being. You know, Mike Stewart, he loves to praise. I mean, he, he loves to praise loud, and 
And, you know, he loves to sing and dance and, and Kim will dance, sing and dance and all that. And I like that. It's just not my style. <laughs> you know, sometimes I just kind of sit here like this. Mm -hmm. But I'm worshiping every bit as much as they are. But it's just not my style. But, you know, how dare me to go say, oh, man, you need to chill out. First of all, he knocked me in the snot locker, which I would deserve. But second thing, who, do, who am I to keep somebody else from worshiping the Lord in the way that they get it? You see what I'm saying? And, and so the thing about it is we need to thank God. We, we are not to thank God sometimes, but always at all times. We can even thank Him for the most difficult times in our life. A friend of mine has cancer now. And they're going, he's going to have to have some surgery. And he's thankful. One that he's got friends that have been through the same thing that I have, or that he has. Because I'm, I'm with her too, so I'm able to minister to him. But he also knows, he also knows that the next phase of ministry is getting ready to start for him. And he's going to take that time during his recovery to really focus on God to see where the next move is. And so that's good. He's able to worship in the midst of, of, of terrible, terrible agony. But you know something I will tell you? I will tell you some of the most... It's really hard when you're going through something difficult to worship. You know, when when there's more month than there is money. When you're really sick and you can't do anything. And when the pain is unbearable. It's really hard to be thankful. <clears throat> Do your best. And God will honor. Alright, so we've talked about spiritual living in our worship life, alright? But now let's talk about the one thing that drives people nuts. Our wedded life. Come on. Uh, I think it locked up. So let me go back there and piddle with it for just a second. Decided it wanted it decided it wanted to sign in to something else. So. Our wedded life. Now I know some of us are married and some of us aren't. Okay? But right. But learning these principles help us to deal with other people also, okay? So in verse 21 it says, submitting yourselves. To one, another, one to another in the fear of God. And then it gives a special command to wives and husbands. The word submission, boy, people use that one bad, don't they? But it's not a synonym for doormat or slave. Okay? Submission, okay, repeat, repeat after me. Submission does not mean... I am a doormat or a slave. Okay. It refers to equal people submitting voluntarily to one another out of obedience to God's word. So in other words, in other words, I can submit myself to Mike. Mike can submit myself to me. I can submit myself to Dave and so on and so forth. He does give an example, a very important example now, of marriage. But it's more than just that, okay? Verse 21 says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
Wives are be to are to be submissive to their husband, not someone else's husband. Now, it does not mean it does not mean that women are inferior to men, or does it mean that they're subject to men? Look what Galatians three verse twenty eight says. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. Wives are to submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. That means they willingly submit to someone who loves them. Now, it's not absolute. In other words, if a husband wants his wife to do something that goes against Scripture or her conscience, she must refuse. All right, it does not give a husband the right to be a pooter head. It does not give him give him a right to be freaky or any of this other stuff that goes in our minds all the time. Okay? And this principle is found when Peter and the apostles were commanded to stop preaching about Jesus. When they were told, basically, don't preach his name. And they said, we ought, we ought to obey God rather than the man. So in other words, they're obeying God. When the woman submits to her husband, she's obeying God. All right? Paul continues, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. That word head there is kephale, and it means leader and declares the husband to be the spiritual leader of the family as Christ is the head of the church. In other words, my job as the husband is to be the spiritual leader of my household. It doesn't necessarily mean I have the final say. But it does mean that I'd better be in my word. I'd better know what God says. I'd better be praying to seek the answer that God wants for our family. That makes sense? So Mike and Carol, they're, they are totally different than Kimberly and I. Kenny and Nancy are totally different. Their family dynamic is a whole lot different than mine and vice versa. So as husbands, it's our responsibility to be in, to be in communication with the Lord to see what is best for the family. When we do that, and when we treat our wives the way we're supposed to, our wives will naturally submit to us. In other words, honey, I think, I think we need to spend our money here instead of here. Okay. Did you pray about it? Yes, I did. All right, then I'm going to trust you. That's basically what it is. And that's just an example. Okay. Look at Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you realize that as a spiritual leader of my household, my number one job is to serve my wife before myself? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. Because I still live in the flesh, and I'm still stupid. Okay, I mean, I'll admit it. I, I don't got any problem with it. But when you look at, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Basically, what when a wife is submissive to her husband, she's supportive of her husband's leadership. That's it. God has wired us as men to be protective, to lead, to be strong, and to provide. And, we, and if we're doing it to the best of our abilities, our wives will submit to us. Now, I realize that is, that goes against modern American culture and feminism big time. And right now, feminism is so bad that, that you know, basically women, oh, many women are saying they don't need men. But they do. And we need women. We need each other. It's just a selfish trap from the enemy. And we've got to be careful with that. But here's what, but before we men get away 
spiel from this. It says, Husbands, love your wives as even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. You know what that means? As a, as a husband, I have to love my wife so much that I would die for her. <coughs> Ooh, that's, that's unusual. I would give my life for my wife. I would do it. Because I know it would honor her and honor God. Now I realize, I totally realize that goes against the modern American culture. But if modern American culture is so good, why is it that our world is falling apart? Why is it? If everything, if everything that modern day culture says is so good, why isn't there peace, love, and utopia instead of dysfunction, brokenness, and heartache? Once again, I'm not talking perfection here, okay? Few women would have any difficulty submitting to a husband who loves her as Christ loves the church. Okay, and that's the bottom line. Look at look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not brag, it is not puffed up. Nothing reveals the spirituality and character of a man like how he treats his wife. If a husband is rude, unkind, demeaning, or acts superior to his wife, he is not filled with the Holy Spirit because he's disobeying the commandments of everything we just read. All right. Paul explains the purpose of Christ giving himself up for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It's called it's called the cleansing power of God's word, folks. That's it. <coughs> you know, um, the as a husband, when I obey the word of God, it does have a cleansing effect on my family. There's a lot more peace in the house. Even when things are, are crashing around you. Yep. When there is more month than there is money. And all of us have faced that. Many of us face it now. But when we get that way, I, I, I just keep reminding Kim, I like, you, you know, we don't even worry about this anymore because we go back to the fact that you remember when God took care of us? Remember the ketchup bottle story? We go, yeah. Think God will take care of us now? Of course he will. Then we're just not going to worry about our own. Nah. God's always got us. And I tell you what, it, it helps. Because the bottom line is, you know, the question for husbands are, is, is my wife more holy and without blemish because of me? I certainly hope Kimberly is half as much a better person because she's married to me as, because I'm, as I am married to her. She makes, me, she makes me a lot better person. Even when she does say things that cut me to the quick. Because she's right. And vice versa. That's why Paul goes on to say, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, he that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. That means we are not to treat her like property or a slave. That's the way they did it in Paul's day. Oh, big time. I mean, you know, Paul, remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. Do you realize that they had open slave markets? And basically what they would do, they would parade the people naked. And, and the people would go and basically prod and probe the bodies. A lot of times people would buy a slave and make them their wife. That still happens today, especially in Eastern countries. And it's not good. Paul quotes, he, he quotes Genesis 
And Jesus repeated it in Matthew 19, verse 5. But he says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined us to his wife, and they, and they too shall become one flesh. When we marry, we leave and cleave. It means our spouse takes precedence over every other human relationship. The word translated join means to join permanently or glue together. <laughs> Marriage is permanent. It is not, well, I'm not happy at the moment. But that's the enemy's plan. He wants to destroy it. Look what Matthew 19 verse 6 says. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Listen, in God's eyes, marriage is permanent. Someone might say, though, I'm the guilty party in divorce. Is that an unforgivable sin? No. No. The Scripture says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to me. If you, listen, if you get anything from me tonight, there is only one sin that is unpardonable, and that is rejection of Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's it. Even then, you still get the opportunity to repent of that. But there does come a time when there is no more time. And if you have rejected Him at that point, there is no forgiveness. That's it. That's why you got to look at five, verse 533 to finish this out. In any case, let each one of you love his own wife as himself and let the wife respect her husband. Listen, two words describe the spirit-filled marriage. Love sums up the husband's responsibility and respect sums up the wife's. All right? Now, I realize a lot of us may not be married in this room. But we have relationships we deal with every day. Okay? You go to the, you go to Burger King, and for the tenth time in a row, they bring you the wrong burger. Show respect. And be gentle. Your boss, once again demeans you in front of other people. Be respectful. Because remember, if you're a born-again believer, you are just an alien on this planet. And even though it sucks at the moment, this is not your permanent place. Heaven is. Hallelujah. Heaven is. So living the spirit-filled life recognizes, it requires us to recognize what the substitutes are and then just to review the results of it. And then next week, I believe we're going to be starting in one of the most important chapters in Ephesians chapter 6. Thank you, Lord, in the name of, of your son, Jesus Christ, who let us just glean from this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now. Basically, I have uh, four more lessons in the, in the series. Okay, I'll have two, two lessons. We'll go to lesson 12 and 13. Okay, then, then that, that comes to May 19th, and uh, that is the blessing of the bikes at Bald Knob Cross, and I'll be on my bike with some of us from the church, and we're going to be going to Bald Knob, so I will not be here. Brother Dave will be teaching the lesson that night, so... He'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple weeks when it gets closer. All right, then we'll finish up. And then from there, I'm not sure I'm not sure where we're going to go. I don't think it's going to be Galatians, brother. I think it's going to be something else. But I do appreciate the fact that you made me study that because it had been a while since I studied that. So you, God used you there. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure where we're going to go after that. But we still have four more lessons to go and we're getting to the good stuff. All right? See you guys next week. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> Very first, yeah.
that point that Can you match? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, you got a match point. Oh, yeah, yeah where are you? I know. Uh, uh, you know, where? Uh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, this is right. I think I've never said he said he's not a man. This is me. He said yes, Dad. Well, not the car. How long you can play before he does? To go all over the place. Jimmy, what are you going to yeah. Yeah, I go. I've gone every year now for. Oh man, eight nine years now. So yeah, we'll be going. We're going to be taking some new guys up there this year. That's nice. Mm -hmm. He's back in the office, I think. He is. Or do you mean during the week or do you mean during the Sunday night? Miles. Let me show you something. No, no, look in. Look in. Put your hands on the side, not the end. Look up towards the light. Look towards the light. Look up at the light. Turn it. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, David. You're welcome. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. What is inside the line? Maybe we go turn it in there and press it. Wow. We'll just turn the tablet back off and we get the power off and we are not going <laughs> What are you doing today? Wait for some of those comes in there. Maybe we got to go down for a little bit. We had to go Bob not cross. Oh, we got a Bob not cross. I've been there a lot of times. Oh, okay. I was, I was, I was, uh, <coughs> I was I'm looking at the turn of the light. Sweetheart. Let's see what it's looking here. And was that's raised it. There. Did that's you see it. any shapes? You hold it up more, the more light you can see. I'm coming, Nancy. 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 You better. Mm -hmm. All right. That was yeah. a good sermon. Thank you. I hope you like Bob Knob. Oh, I love it. He's been there a bunch of times. Been there about. You? I've been there so many times. I can't tell you. I have too. Maybe we just turn it to tap and all that. It's probably not the same since you've been there. The. Uh, well, the, I was raised at Kings. Yeah. The visitor center now, they've, re, they've redone it all. Oh, I have to go back up And they painted really nice signs up there. And, and at the cross itself, they painted these signs and tells the history of the cross on it. Oh, yeah? It, it's really neat. Well, i got to go back up there. Good deal. What do you remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we got to go back up there. All right. Hey, Miles, when you get ready, I've got some Sour Patch candies there. Huh? Open that. We have some sour patch sour hearts. Sour hearts? Yeah. Oh. So you were trying yeah, to get my attention right. a minute ago. What happened to your leg? I Nathan? had uh, a little bit of osteoarthritis for years. Oh. Nothing just happened. Mm. I don't have pain, hardly ever, ever. Mm. I walk a little crooked. But if somebody wants to go in there and break a bunch of stuff mm. and I have to suffer for months to get over it, I don't want to. I don't hurt. I'm just awkward. I have like a little bit of circulation issue in my lowest, lower legs. And then I've got a little bit of a crooked hip and one knee that's a little bit, more, but it doesn't hurt. Nothing happened. No, no sudden I know when I, when I broke my femur. Oh, well, you went through a lot. Then. Oh, no, I didn't. I praise God. He took the pain away. I had no pain. My, my doctor called me after I got my, my leg brace off. He says, you got to come back to, to, to the hospital. I said, why? She says, you broke your femur. I said, 
What's that? She said, the top one your side? Going. Yeah. I said, what? Do you guys she know says, where my guy went? Where Nathan went? He's looking for Ken. Oh, yeah, he probably headed. You know, do you oh, know where the young. nursery is? You take no that green door? I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Anyway, he's all the way back in the office. When when the doctor said that, it's like I laughed. He said, "But I don't hurt." She said, "You don't hurt at all." It's like, "No." Wow. I said, "Really?" I said, "Praise." I said, "Praise the Lord." I said, "Because I'm telling you, it was right here." The blessing of the Lord was really I all never over had you. any pain. Yeah. That's what I said. The good Lord took care of it. I'm telling you. I just I had a. Just for years and years, I had just I went to a doctor about it, and she said, "Well, there's like three different little things added together that makes me kind of awkward." Said, "You got a little bit of osteoarthritis just down in here, just, just a little oh, in the knees. She said, just a little bit of a um, not real bad circulation problem. Um, the more I'm walking, the better it is. If I stand, I couldn't be a greeter at Walmart." Mm -hmm. Where they just want you to just stand right. perfectly still. That yeah. that's bad for me. Yeah. If I walk back and forth, then I'm okay. Yeah. But anyway, and then there's what else? Oh, I had a the way I go downstairs, I look like a little kid. I go step, step. <laughs> and then, but but that way I I if yeah, I bend a certain yeah. way, yeah, that'll hurt. Mm -hmm. I just have to. I had. I don't I take big have... wide steps when going downstairs. I take little steps. I, I, since I was here, I got both of my knees. Aha, I have to. Ah, uh, several of us have. Hey, oh, could I? I'll eat one if you don't care. That, oh, that's a nice one. Thank yeah. you, Brother Mike. They're still warm? Still warm. Hey, you got pecan trees, don't Are these from your tree? I want, I want this one because I can't eat nuts. You might have to knock them off right there. I will, honey. Thank you. There you go. I don't want none right now. Really? Should All right. We, put it in your pocket, then. Yeah, should we get a yeah, little Ziploc bag? Wow. You want a Ziploc bag, Linda, or can you put it in there? Here. Here, Linda. Here. 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 Tell you that, huh? Don't worry, I'll eat them. Oh, no, you're fine. Especially if you got My dad used to say that, Greg, all the time. Yeah. I'd be standing in front of the TV and didn't realize it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Hey, you have a wonderful.